so it is called generation as does when you're born shape um uh, who you are and it's i suppose the main theme of the book is that i believe that generational thinking is a really powerful idea that's been horribly corrupted by terrible small bits of research stereotypes and myths that have given us completely the wrong idea about different cohorts and it starts with a discussion of some really big thinkers like Karl Mannheim who was a Hungarian sociologist who basically gave us a lot of our thinking today on how generations are formed into particular identities because of when they were born and the experiences they went through when they were in their formative um, years and it's got kind of builds on the work of other big thinkers like Auguste Comte uh, French philosopher who uh, effectively was saying that generations is one of the most important things to understand how societies change. He said we should not hide the fact that our social progress rests essentially upon death um, uh, because once we get past our formative years we tend not to change so much. So if uh, we don't have a new generation coming through um, we don't get that sense of change. So the successive steps of humanity necessarily require a continuous renovation from one generation to the next. So we've got these really big important ideas about generations which is really sad when you see what the generational discussion is today. So today instead of that big thinking we get things like millennials are killing the napkin industry. These are the sort of headlines that you might see referencing generations. Um, and there's a lot about millennials. You could fill a whole presentation about things millennials are supposed to have killed or ruined or whatever. Um, uh, but older generations don't get out of it either. And it is for baby boomers in particular, uh, it is more about ruining things um, rather than killing them. So uh, in this case, they've ruined parenting, not just now, but forever. Uh, but there's lots and lots of headlines about how baby boomers have ruined um, uh, everything. And that, that really is sad because I think your point, Frank, is a good one at the beginning about history, because I think generational thinking is automatically future focused. And in fact, you know, building on Comte and Mannheim, I think you can only understand the future if you understand what is truly generational because of this pattern, really, which is. Uh, just plotting the different generations, the five generations that we typically talk about in the UK and US and countries like that, where that's the share of the adult population made up from each of those cohorts. And you can see the older generation dying out, being replaced by younger generations coming through in this continuous process of renovation across uh, generations. And the balance now, so it's really, if there are real differences between these generations, that's really important to understand because the balance in the population is changing all the time. So it's a, the only way to understand the future. And that's really the task in the book. I try to separate period, life cycle and cohort effects. Period effects are things that happen and affect all of us, like economic crashes or pandemics. Life cycle effects are really important too, because we change as we age uh, or go through particular life stages. And then cohort effects are these generational effects. So the job of the book is not to claim that everything is generational, uh, but to separate out these effects to see what is. So I'll just give you one or two examples. I'm not going to go, I'll speed through this. Um, but the main theme in many ways is that the generational stereotypes are fueling fake generational battles and climate change is one of the big ones on this and, and we are unthinkingly encouraging this sort of generational conflict. So when Greta Thunberg was made person of the year by time in 2019, she was called a standard bearer in a generational battle. Um, uh, which, you know, it, it, the whole piece was about how we're setting this up. Climate change is a, is a battle between old and young. The US singer Billie Eilish was more direct. Uh, she said, uh, hopefully the adults and the old people start listening to us about climate change. Old people are going to die and don't really care if we die, but we don't want to die uh, yet. Um, that's quite an extreme uh, representation of this, but it's the sentiment is quite common. But the problem is um, there's no real big generational, when you look at the actual evidence, there's no big generational break in concern about the environment. This is some of the sorts of charts that we uh, look at in the book. Um, this is a proportion of American adults thinking that the rise in world temperature caused by greenhouse effect is extremely or very dangerous. And looking at plotting that over time by generation, you can see there's a bit of a difference with Gen Z and millennials being slightly higher, but it's very small. Um, compared to Gen X and baby boomers. It's like you know, a few percentage points difference, nothing like you would expect from the, the rhetoric. And then when you look in more detail, in, as I do in the book, 
it's older generations are more likely to boycott products for social purpose reasons, not younger generations, despite all this claim about younger generations being more focused on those types of things. We're really creating a generational division that is very important because it's self-defeating. We, we need everyone to feel connected to climate concern um, because that's how we're going to uh, uh, enable change on these types of things. But instead, we're creating these divisions between generations that don't really exist, which is uh, one of the big problems. The second example I was going to give is about culture wars, because it's a very similar sort of point. We, we don't have a new generation of snowflakes or social justice warriors um, right now. Um, that's not to say that there isn't a difference between old and young on people. What the evidence shows is that there are clear gaps between young and old and attitudes to race, immigration, gender equality, identity, sexuality. But the crucial point is they're not unusual gaps. The gap between young and old today is no larger than the gap between young and old uh, in the past. Uh, it's just the issues have changed. The issues constantly change. And in fact, in many ways, the baby boomers were more different from their parents than young people are from baby boomers today. Um, the bigger sort of gaps there. So, I mean, it is the it's a, the effect. Instead, what's going on is two things, really. Thinking that today's young people are uniquely wrong and weird is just a constant of history. We always think the latest generation are the worst um, of all time. And then it goes all the way back to Socrates. He really didn't like young people um, in his day. Children now love luxury. They have bad manners, show disrespect for their elders. Even 400 BC, this was the idea. He rolled that forward through every era, 1771. Um, a race of effeminate, self-admiring, emaciated fribbles was a letter to Town and Country magazine, which could be a definition of snowflakes just a few hundred years uh, before we actually started talking about snowflakes. And then the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, 1843 talked about uh, young people didn't like the morals of young people and particularly young ladies in the market town of Bilston who'd taken to drive coal carts, ride astride upon horses, drink, swear, fight, smoke, whistle, sing and care for nobody, which just makes Bilston sound like a great place for a night out, to be honest. Um, but it feels worse. So the second point, that's one point, is it's a constant that we denigrate young people. Um, but it feels worse now because it's a period effect uh, it's mixed with this period effect of more fractious politics, media and social media. We hear more from the extremes now than we did in the past. So we've got this greater sense of difference between young and old on these uh, types of emergent issues than we did in the past. Uh, the other theme, I think the only other <clears throat> theme I want to cover, because I'm conscious of time in this, is that inequality is increasingly generational and intergenerational. Um, and that's why it's really important to understand uh, generations. Um, and you can see that in these incredible changes in life story uh, that people have gone through, particularly younger generations, and not an extraordinary change in home ownership. So the pre-war, this is what proportion of people own their own home by the generation. Pre-war and baby boomers more or less followed the same path um, over time. So around eight and 10 ended up owning their own home. My generation, Gen X, looked like we were going to go and join them. But then house price rises in the early 2000s, and the financial crash that followed just deflected us away from that. So we ended up six and 10, that sort of level, owning their own home. And then it just never got going for millennials in owning their own home. So utterly different life course based on when you were born. Being born in the same economic circumstances just a few, couple of decades earlier, you got a much higher chance of home ownership with all the knock-on effects on your finances uh, that that brings. Um, uh, in terms of higher housing costs, etc. Uh, and then, you know, the, the uh, downside of this, again, that denigration of young people, that instead of these massive economic forces that have gone on, you get a lot of victim blaming of young people of um, five money tips mm -hmm. millennials can learn from their grandparents, eat at a responsibly priced restaurant, it all comes out the same, same the next day as some of the advice that is given against this sort of uh, massive economic forces, when that is not the case. These are not the causes. It's not spendthrift young people that is the problem here. It's much bigger um, uh, financial forces. So the key point in the book is that there's a false choice between either generation or socioeconomic groups being key. It's how the two interact that is increasingly important because all of that wealth, there's a lot of wealth concentrating at the top of the age range among a subset of older groups, not everyone, but in a subset of older groups. And that is going to fall down to younger generations very unevenly. Um, 
And the real worry is because of wealth, private wealth has become so much more important to our, how we feel economically, uh, that that is setting in life chances for future generations. If you happen to come from wealthier parents, that is going to give you such an increased boost compared to in the past because wealth has grown so much through housing and other aspects uh, of, of finances that it means that uh, if your parents have it, it's going to be much more important to your life chances. So that leads to the kind of final point that we are losing faith that things will be better for our kids than they were for us, which is really a key uh, change for how we view society. We ask people across um, 30 countries whether they think today's youth will have a better worse life than their parents or will it be about the same. This is just the bottom eight um, countries from that 30 list. And you can see the UK down here, fifth from bottom on this. We've only got a quarter of people now saying that they expect things to be better for their kids and nearly half saying they expect it to be worse. And that's a turnaround in 2003 it was uh, half of people saying it was going to be better and, and a quarter uh, saying it's going to be worse. So we've, we've switched around on this um, since then in terms of our, our optimism from the future. So again, the key thing with the book is this is not about old versus young. It's not about just shifting resources from old to young. Uh, it is about how we all see the future because we're so connected to each other up and down the, uh, up and down the age ranges through our families. Um, one very final point, then I'll just skip through to the end is there is no generational war brewing um, as a result of this. You might think that young people might be uh, uh, revolting against this, but they're not because they're so, we're so interconnected into our families uh, and because of many other reasons why young people won't uh, go to war with um, uh, their grandparents or, or parents over things like this. There's no generational war brewing, but what is uh, a real issue is more the separation in where we live and how we live our lives. This is the old age dependency ratio between different types of towns, cities, villages, uh, etc. And up until 1991, there was no real difference in the age profile. So this is how many old people are relative to 65 plus there are relative to people of working age. Um, but since then, you've just seen this explosion in divergence where the cities have got younger and younger uh, and non-city areas have got older. So we're living in different sorts of places and we're also living very separate digital lives. Um, this is the proportion of adults owning a smartphone uh, by generation. Uh, and this is just like a, a single indicator. There's much more divergence on what people are doing on their smartphones with older generations just in different places to younger generations on different social media platforms uh, having different sorts of conversations. So we've got this uh, uh, separation, which is a, is a real problem. And that's feeding through into our politics um, in a new way uh, in our political connections. So we uh, really um, easy to forget how little age difference there was in Labour Party support across generations. For throughout as far back as we could go, which is 1983 in terms of the data that we have, if you look at that line, it goes up and down over time, but all generations, um, all age groups, pretty much the same likelihood of supporting the Labour Party until the last few years, where you've had this real explosion and difference um, between Labour Party support. And that's risky. Splitting politics on age is risky um, because of uh, you start to build in these types of differences where one side thinks that they've got demography on their side and they just have to keep going as they are and people, more voters will come towards them. The other side thinks they have to accentuate how extreme the other side is uh, focusing on culture war type issues in order to draw their base towards them. And it becomes this terrible dynamic that we've seen play out in the US. So final point, I'll just leave it here is three main actions um, I think we need to focus on is focus on intergenerational inequality. That's our real issue over the next few years is how does, how does this embed life chances? How do these changes that we've seen in bad life chances over time. Uh, we need to rebuild and, and protect generational, intergenerational contact, because we've lost a lot of that. And there's huge studies that show great value in old, older groups and younger groups coming together and having more contact. So both sides, it's like um, you get double the value from it because both sides benefit from it. And finally, we need to embed longer term thinking. Um, such a short-term cycle that these big generational issues, political cycles, uh, that 
uh, none of these types of intergenerational connections or long-term views uh, get any kind of credence with government policy or action. And there's a great book, a novel called The Ministry for the Future by Kim, Lee, Kim Stanley Robinson, which you may have seen, which is all about what you can achieve if you have that more future focus. This is about setting up a global uh, group that is uh, explicitly supposed to think of how decisions today affect generations that have yet to be born. Um, and I think that, that type of thinking is trying to embed that more in our structures and cultures is going to be crucial if we're going to deal with some of these big, big long-term challenges that we've got in the future. I'll stop there. <laughs>